All right, cool. So now I can start. Again, welcome to everybody. Uh, always a delight to see you. And, and I'll ask again, does anyone have any sense of being called to open our occasion in prayer? I'm not afraid. <laughs> you know, when you're when you've been raised in a Baptist church, you always have to be able to do that. I'm sorry. Amen. Amen. No, it's good. It's good. <laughs> okay. Lord, thank you for this time together we have to learn more about you and your word and just help us to um, take these words and apply them to our lives and help us to grow in you and follow you better. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome again. Uh, so uh, here we are, and uh, we're in James. Now, I want you to know before I begin uh, that I prepared three verses, um, <laughs> and I have five pages of notes on three verses, and uh, we may go over the interrogation that is this right after what we finished last week, um, and if we do go over uh, the interrogation, then we will uh, move on to... Uh, the instruction, but uh, so if I can uh, talk of the beginning of James chapter two, which is we did the first four verses last week, and if we think of James chapter two, uh, it, the first thirteen verses can be broken down into three sections, and and we might be able to call them the inconsistency, the interrogation, and the instruction. Now, last week we did the inconsistency. Uh, what was the inconsistency of the early messianic community? Does anyone remember the, the, the community to whom James was writing? Showing partiality. Partiality. Uh, and what kind of partiality? Between rich and poor. Mm. Yes, between the rich and the poor. And uh, not what God wants. Um, and uh, today he's going to go into an interrogation of sorts. Now, I don't really know if we can really go through five, six, and seven uh, as complexly or need to as complexly as I kind of broke it down, but let's do it anyway. Does uh, anyone have, Byron, are you holding those up for me to see? No. Okay, cool. I was trying to see if I was like, am I supposed to read that? Um <laughs> Does anyone have their Bible open uh, to James chapter two and can read verses five through seven? I have the, um, oops, yeah. I have the, what is this version again? <laughs> Revised standard version? Blessings, yes. Let's listen to it, Gary. Uh, five, we start with five. Yes, sir. L listen, my beloved brethren, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs to the kingdom which he has promised to keep, promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor man. Is it not the rich who oppress you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme that honorable name by which you are called? And there we go. Wow. Yeah. What are we thinking so far with regards to all that? No, that's cool. Um, that's the revised standard version, which was written, I think, sometime in the, uh, the 50s. Uh, it's a good translation. I like it. Still do. Uh, does anyone have a different translation that they would like just to hear as well? That's when I got this Bible in the 50s, so I probably is. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. And it's awesome that you're still using the Bible that you got back then. Anybody else? Different translation. And you may be muted if I'm talking still in your reading. I think I have the wrong page. Is it Peter 1 or Peter 2? It's James 2. No wonder. I, yeah, I really have the wrong. That, yes. Amen. Well, that's all right. <laughs> Okay. Tell you what, I'm going to read uh, from the translation of my favorite commentary on James. Listen, my beloved. Now that's so far the exact same that you had, Gary. Right? Listen. Yes. 
my beloved. Now, again, as soon as you hear listen, what are you thinking? Pay attention. Pay yeah. attention. Listen means pay attention. Now, uh, where else have you may have heard listen in the scriptures? <laughs> People wonder, like, how can he take so long to go through three verses? And then he reads, listen, listen my beloved, and stops. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, listen uh the, the word listen is it in both greek and hebrew is the same word as for here listen here they're, they're not differentiated the same way that they are in english and so the shema that again we've been talking about that is so important to james and he's actually going to get into the shema and that leviticus 19 18 in the instruction part in verses 8 through 13 that we are probably not getting to today because I'm being realistic because I'm already talking about listen. And, um, <laughs> but so, so Shema has that piece like, hear, O, listen, O Israel. And, and there's that piece. There's other parts where, where God is, being, is, is, is trying to get people to listen. And, and what does it mean to listen? Keep a keep an open mind and try try to really absorb without thinking for a response. Just absorb and and not have uh, other things entering your mind. Like, what am I going to say back to this guy? And so you have two solid pieces of listen right there. Uh, with the attention, there's a sense that you better pay attention when you are told listen. Jesus will sometimes say, "Listen to this parable." Listen to this kind of thing. Um, listen to big. Uh, it means all sorts of things like that. But yes, it has a sense of paying attention, being attentive to the words that you're actually saying. Now, I have to say this to my children on occasion, or my wife has to say this to me on occasion. When I'm just like, she's like, "Are you listening to me?" I'm like, "Yeah, of course, of course." What what did, what did I just say? Are you listening to me? That's what you said, and. Um, I, that she never is excited when I say that, by the way, which is <laughs> shocking to me. But, uh, but um, like, so listen, pay attention. But then there's a second piece of that, which is absorb. And there's a deeper meaning to just paying attention when you absorb it, it. You let it fill your being. So he's not only saying for them to pay attention, and he wants them to pay attention after the way that they have been treating the poor and the rich differently. And, and he's going to now instruct them. Now, listen absorb what i'm saying but there's always a part that's beyond the absorption of what they're saying when somebody's told listen and what's that next part that's a part of the whole thing i guess it's understand what he's talking about understand and 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 if you're going to understand and listen and all the rest of these kinds of things uh, what I mean, what needs to happen for it to, to be real, according to James, perhaps, or Jesus, or anybody else? Let me put it this way with my children. Listen to me. I'll say to my children, vacuum the room. Now, if they're like, okay, Dad, we heard you. But they don't actually vacuum the room. I then say to my children, do you not listen to me when I'm talking to you? Vacuum the room. That sense of action that's involved in it as well. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, anyone who hears these words of mine and does them. In this sense of you just don't listen to listen, you have to do something. And so he has all of this in the word listen. It's, again, very Jewish. It happens. His brother said things like this. And then again, my beloved brothers and sisters. Um, the NR or the RSB had brethren, which is certainly a word that we don't say anymore. Does anyone say brethren anymore just for fun? Or no? no, no. And you know why? Because it's a weird word. Um, so we just say things that make more sense, like what we say. So, so the word, again, in Greek is Adelphos, which is actually easy for me to remember because I was a, a member of a fraternity called the Adelphos. Um, but it means brothers. And, um, and, and 
as we understand it now, brothers and sisters, my beloved brothers and sisters. Now, I've several times already talked about how important it is about brothers and sisters. I, I don't think I need to kind of harp on that again. But if you hear brothers and sisters, what, what on earth does that mean? Too. Like when he starts going back into brothers and sisters, as we've talked about. You want the overhead. Oh, then we're all family. Yes, then we're all family. Like this community is a family. You get to be my family. And have you ever noticed that families are not that great at being awesome all the time? <laughs> like, don't get me wrong. I, I have to constantly apologize to my family. I have said many things whereby my father turned to my mother and said to my mother, Christina, you did a horrible job raising our children. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, like it's, it's a part, <clears throat> families are hard sometimes. The, the, it's incredible what you can have. But so when he uses the familial bond and I counted it up, um, he, uh, I need to find it. Um, he, he, uh, he calls them brothers and sisters 14 times in the letter, 14 times. That's five chapters. That's not very long. He's harping on this sense of a familial unit. And is he disappointed in his brothers and sisters? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And has he decided that they're no longer his brothers and sisters? No, he's spending more time calling them brothers and sisters right now than he might even had otherwise if he was happy with them. So I love this little piece right here. He is not happy. He's upset. And, and sometimes I know that people are upset with me or I'm upset with other people. And, and sometimes I've wanted to give up on people, say, I'm done. I, I wash my hands of you. I'm, I'm very Pontius Pilate. If anyone's trying to be like Pontius Pilate, chances are you've already failed a little bit at life. He's not the hero of the story. So let's try. <laughs> No kidding. Uh, I'm sorry. I've I've never. I've, I'm, anyway, welcome to my ADD. <laughs> I. Uh, <laughs> but here is someone who's not washing his hands of them at all, and he's going to get even into why he's not washing their hands of them if we read into it that right kind of way. And God knows I'm going to force you to see that if you stick with me through the whole kind of thing. So my beloved too, and I love the word beloved. Has anyone ever called you their beloved? No. That's a bit of an old fashioned no. term as well. Mm-hmm. Like I, generally when I think of the term beloved, not in a biblical context, I think of it as somebody in the thirties writing a love letter to somebody else. Mm-hmm. Like I expect my, my grandfather, God rest his soul and my grandmother to have exchanged letters where they call each other beloved. Um, it's it's very personal. It uh it it's 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 an enduring kind of quality. Uh, it almost seems sentimentalized now in that kind of way. If I were to refer to someone as my beloved, I'd wonder what that'd be like. While simultaneously, maybe I should do that more often to the people I love. My beloved, boy, that's like I I, I imagine if I just grabbed onto my 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 children and be like my beloved. Uh, but he's taking that moment to show his his enduring quality to these people that he keeps calling brothers and sisters but now he's about to begin slapping them a little bit because even if they're beloved brothers and sisters sometimes it's okay to slap them and i imagine that part of the reason he's okay with slapping his beloved brothers and sisters around just a little bit is because his older brother probably slapped him around just a little bit in an effort to allow him to grow and he wants them to grow. He doesn't want them to lose sight of what is truly this kingdom, what is truly this joy of what it gets to be to know Christ Jesus as their glorious Christ Jesus, their Lord that way. He doesn't want them to lose any of that because the thing that's fascinating about how easily people lose it and lose it today and lose it then 2000 years ago is that once the world starts to seem to fall upon us, we end up doing whatever we can do to feel comfortable. And that means that we're going to go back to all the ways to be the world. On Sunday, I talked a little bit about the difference between Pharisees, Sadducees, uh, Heridians and Zealots. And maybe you uh, paid attention and maybe you didn't which is fine because it was a very long sermon 
Um, and uh, that's fine because I heard that uh, Eugenia preached for mm. 30 minutes normally. So congratulations. Oh you just God. have another long-winded preacher. Uh, but um, like they, they had these different ways of trying to exist within the framework of Rome where they could be comfortable. And, and Jesus offered this totally new way. And James didn't, and the new way, by the way, was inner peace where you're not trying to worry about everything that everybody has in that same kind of way while constantly fighting for justice by yourself living lifting up the least of these that are right around you we've allowed ourselves this is actually just me talking a lot of what i consider my doing of justice is complaining about the injustice that others are experiencing instead of lifting up those that i can and Jesus was always lifting up those that he could, those that were right around him, to change the very ethic of what it meant. And, and here's James trying to do the same thing because he sees what happens when people are willing to talk about things instead of actually doing them. Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has God not chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith? <laughs> Now, this is the first of four questions that he's asking, but this is this is a rhetorical device. It, there's four questions. The first question is the big question, and I didn't even read the whole question. And then he uh, then he has a, a sentence in between the first question where he's basically telling them that they've uh, they've done this, but all the questions assume the answer is yes. And then he kind of breaks it on down a little bit more. But the answer to James is yes. God has chosen the poor of the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him. We're going to unpack that sentence because it's deep. But before we do, this is of course the not time, first time he's talking about the poor being chosen. On a side note, what do you all think about the idea that God chooses some and not chooses others? <clears throat> Say that again. What do you think about the idea that God chooses some over and against others. I'm not comfortable with it. Barb, thank you for being honest. It's an uncomfortable feeling, right? Because then yes. I'm wondering, am I in or am I out? Can I just let you all rest assured right now that since we're here together, even if we're not as perfect here as James might want us to be, he's also would be calling us brothers and sisters. And so there is an assumption that we're in. And, and I don't know if God limits God's choosing or not, but the idea of election is incredibly biblical. Who are the first in the Bible to be chosen by God? over and against others. Uh, Kathy, you're muted if you're trying. To I know, I was just muttering. Yeah. I was thinking Adam and Eve, but that might not be right. Uh, Adam and Eve, they're certainly chosen. They're chosen to do these certain things and they fail at it. And so you can say that they're chosen and you're right. And that would be the first. So congratulations. Um, not what I was thinking, but you certainly were writer than I was. So. Um, yeah, and if we go through some of the story of Genesis, we see over and over again, the over and against others uh, of being chosen. Uh, you have Abram and Sarai, but then by the time that they have children, Isaac is chosen over and against Ishmael. Now, Ishmael's promised plenty of blessings, but Isaac is the one who's chosen for the promises that continue to run through the line of Abraham. Isaac has two children, the oldest being Esau and Jacob being younger, even though they were twins. And so by the nature of the way things were supposed to work back then, Esau would be the one who gets the blessings. But God chose Jacob. He chose the one who, why did he choose Jacob anyway? But he was also the younger one, which is not the first time that God does that. He does it too with Isaac. And as we go on with things, we continually see that God doesn't really choose the ones that we would expect. And then God chooses the people of Abraham, the Hebrews, the, the, what would become the Israelites. That's who God chooses. And, and we know that God chooses them because God says so. Uh, but coupled with God 
pulls them out of Egypt, frees them from Egypt to be a certain kind of people that God uses this nation to bless them. And this is one of the keyest ways that we need to think of Jewish thought because they believe and rightfully so that they are the chosen people of God. And, I, and, and after 4,000 years of believing that, you, you can't really fault them. Like I, they keep on going against all like uh, things that are against them. There they are. And if you think about it too, from them come two of the hugest world religions. And, and, and so there's that sense of chosenness that they have going on that way that is in all of their thinking. And, uh, and, and to, to the chagrin sometimes, even according to Jesus. But the idea of being chosen is very fundamental to the Bible. And, and if I were to give you some fundamental statements, wait, I think I can look them up. Um, if we go to Deuteronomy chapter four, verses 37 through 38, and because he loved your ancestors, he chose their descendants after them. He brought you out of Egypt with his own presence by his great power, driving out before you nations greater and mightier than yours to bring you in, giving you their land for a possession as it is still today. In this part from Deuteronomy, God is also choosing those who are not the strongest ones, who might be considered the more impoverished ones, just like God did in Exodus. And now God is doing again in, in Palestine with that whole kind of thing. Now, Deuteronomy 7, 7 through 8 says, it was not because you were more numerous than any other people that God set his heart on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. It was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath that he swore to your ancestors. And the Lord has brought you out from, with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery and the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. In Deuteronomy 14, 2, for you are all a... For you are people holy to the Lord your God. It is you the Lord has chosen out of all the peoples on earth to be his people, his treasured possession. God's election uh, clearly concerned mostly with choosing Israel as a nation. And the individual Israelites is part of what we're seeing. And the early Christians understood themselves as being part of this chosenness as well. That they were kind of like the, 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 the inevitable consequence of Abraham's promise and now also being the chosen ones. Now, we're Presbyterian and Presbyterians believe in everybody's favorite idea of predestination. Have I talked about predestination here before? I think that I feel like I have. Oh, yeah. A little bit. Mm -hmm. a little bit. Yeah. And that idea of predestination, though, has again to do with our chosenness. Now, Barb... You don't like the idea of someone being chosen against another. And, and, and I, I'm with you, but would you feel comfortable letting your discomfort blossom so you can say exactly why that makes you uncomfortable? Well, there's just an exclusivity aspect or something that I prefer. <laughs> I prefer the aspects of uh, the Bible that uh, try to be more inclusive, I guess, for people. Amen. And so let's dive into this a little bit more and try to figure out why on earth there might be an exclusivity that's going on. And, and, uh, and, and we've already heard about it a little bit. The poor are the ones that that James says God is choosing. Why might the poor be chosen over and against the rich? Well, the, the issue to me is that the rich have, are going their own course and not God's path. So therefore he's looking at the poor as a, um, as a group that would be more loving and godlike. And, and there's those pieces that are absolutely there. Um, I actually think that's a decent way. I, uh, the idea of the rich is not necessarily their wealth. It's how they go about treating others. And by and large, 
uh, those who have a lot of money in the history of the world have used to keep their money unjust ways of going about life in an effort to continue being rich and not having to kind of exist with things in kind of a common way. Um, and doesn't, if I may, uh, doesn't the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, um, support the idea that the Jews are who are rich are rich because they have received the blessings of God. So totally. now the New Testament has shifted that around to be more inclusive. Amen. I, uh, I, and I'm glad you did that because I was going to go through the longest winded way of trying to get there and, and you just said it. <laughs> Um, there is an inclusivity in accepting the poor that doesn't exist with the way the world works. Um, and, and as Jesus will say, you can't serve two masters. You can't serve wealth and God simultaneously. And that is literally just true. Like if we become so caught up with our concern of well-being and security that we have failed to serve God, <laughs> contently no matter what like suffering goes about we're serving two masters and the poor don't have the second master with which to worry now that is a simplified way of saying things because that's also nonsense in the way the world works the poor are always worried about where their security is coming from so we have to play with this all a little bit. God is choosing the poor. Well, let's read some Old Testament stuff to get a sense to see if that's even in the Old Testament as well. The choosing of the poor. Deuteronomy 26, 7. We, which is Israel and Egypt, cried to the Lord and God, the God of our ancestors, the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. So again, that sense of being oppressed, God's making sure those of who are chosen Psalm 918, for the needy shall not always be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor perish forever. And there's all sorts of ways in, in Leviticus and Deuteronomy about how you're supposed to treat the resident aliens and the poor among you. Uh, Psalm 1014, but do you see, indeed, you note know trouble and grief that you may take it into your hands. The helpless commit themselves to you. You have been the helper of the orphan. There is this still endless sense of things. Psalm 1827, for you deliver a humble person, but the haughty eyes you bring down. If the rich are proud in their wealth, they don't have much place to be boasting, as Paul would say, in God. Isaiah 11, 3 through 4, he shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek on the earth. So this is when God's like, I'm, I'm choosing the meek. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lip he shall kill the wicked. Now these things are starting to get a little crazy. They're in the New Testament too. The Magnificat in Luke chapter 1. The songs of Simeon and Anna in Luke chapter 2. And of course, Jesus' version of the Beatitudes in Luke chapter 6. Like, And Paul has a, a little bit of this as well. Um, when he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 27 through 29, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not to reduce to nothing things that are so that no one might boast in the presence of God. And I'm going to interpret James right here from Paul, which if James or Paul knew I was doing this, they would try to string me up. <laughs> Barb, you are rightfully concerned about what seems to be exclusivity. And as Don said, those who have often think that they have and they can boast in what they have. How often have the strong said, I am strong and the powerful use their power to do whatever they want. How often still do powerful people oppress the poor and exploit them? 
God is just. And God says in God's justice that God chooses the plight of the oppressed over and against their oppressors. It's the ironic exclusivity of God. And it's ironic because it's not the way the world is exclusive. When we talk about exclusive, we're talking about how there's someone with power who can exclude those who don't have power. Here God is saying, I include the poor. And the problem that James has with what the community has done is when he said in chapter two or the beginning of chapter two that we did last week, that they have shown favoritism to the rich over and against the poor. And first thing that James is saying is God's favoritism or choosing is for those who are oppressed and who need help that others cannot or don't need. And when the community does not act in that same way, we'll get into it some other ways. You even blaspheme the name in which you were anointed or, uh, or baptized or he'll get into it. And I can't take away your discomfort, Barb. But I'm glad you named it because it's mine too. Because I don't think that the rich who recognize this chosenness of the poor and decide to go into that sense as well. Like there is something that I have to do to lift the poor up over yeah. and against the rich. I believe that's a part of my call as a Christian. Now, that doesn't mean that I'm going to try to oppress the rich. It doesn't mean I get to act toward the rich the way the rich get to act toward the poor. None of it means that. It means when I see a poor person, and a rich person, I have to recognize the poor person is the one in need and who demands my attention. So if I see my biggest donor to my church, I don't like the word donor, and you're not giving a donation, you're giving an offering. It's the recognition that everything you have from God is God's and you're giving something back to God, you're offering it to God. You're a donor, it's yours. And you're suddenly being very kind of like, oh, look what I do with my stuff. Um, like, no, it's an offering. You're offering to God. And, and anyhow, if I see my biggest offerer, a guy who gives like 20% and makes $3 billion a year, and I'm just like, well, and I see the homeless person, and I choose to go up to the billionaire who gives 20% and leave the homeless person there, James is going to say, you scandalize the gospel. What if I say, well, what if I got to both of them? No, still the first one. The first one is the one who's in need. God's preference will always be for the one who's in need over and against the one who's not. And especially if the one who's not is not helping the person who's in need. And it's uncomfortable because now suddenly there's favorites. And the ironic part of the favorites is it's not the ones that are normally considered to be the favorites, which is what God has done over and over and over again. Um, I, I love the Bible for that reason. The Bible says Moabites are not allowed in the assembly to the 10th generation. It's in Deuteronomy. If you have Moabite blood in you, you have to get that Moabite blood out of you for 10 generations before you're allowed in the assembly of God. That's some exclusivity that I don't like, Barb. I don't like it at all. And the best thing about that, too, then, is there's a book in the Bible called Ruth. Ruth is a Moabite. She also happens to be the great-grandmother of David, King David, the, the, the greatest king who was ever king of Israel. The only one they like to talk about because the rest of them are kind of like, Ugh, stinkers, you know? So we'll talk about like, yeah, it's like if we only wanted to talk about Abraham Lincoln, like King David. But, but, but wait, 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 he was a third generation Moabite. He's not even allowed in the assembly according to the laws of the people. And the same book 
that says he's not allowed in the assembly has another book that says, Tada, he's in. So be very careful when we begin to think that people are separated based off how we go about things. So in the midst of all this, yes, I would say God has a preferential treatment for the poor, but does that mean that God will kick the rich out? I would never say that because simultaneously, every time I think I have any idea about God, God goes and changes the whole game on me, not just the rules, the game. So we have to have faith that this one, and, and now this is James talking, though he wants them to pay attention to the poor. God, I would love if churches paid attention to the poor more than trying to get butts in the pews and money in the plates. Wouldn't it be something? And, and, and what does the poor mean to us today? Maybe we should change that a little bit. There's all kinds of poverty. And certainly the, the kind of poverty of monetary need needs to be at the forefront of our discussion. But what other kind of poverty does the church need to meet today in your opinion? What do you think God is calling us to meet in terms of the poverty that exists? Spiritual poverty. Spiritual poverty, which is running rampant in the church. Because the church is all about trying to tell people exactly what they want to hear so they'll keep on coming. Because we see the writing on the wall. People don't care about church like they used to. So we better give them cupcakes. Give them cake. Well, what happened to that last person who said give them cake? Chopped off his head. <laughs> and we're well on our way. And it's not a John the Baptist chop off their head either. It's the end of something, the collapse. There's a revolution that will not be ended until the end of World War II. I don't need to get in that kind of history, sorry. Um, so yes, there's that kind of people. We have to give them spiritual food. We need some meat and potatoes and salad and lots of more vegetables. And I know vegetables don't taste good, but you can figure out how to make them taste better. We just need to give them the right spices, but we need to be eating some vegetables. In the church right now, we're like, give them cake, give them cake, give them cake, keep them coming, keep them coming, keep them coming. No, like, yes, I like that. Spiritual poverty, it exists. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That's why Matthew says that that way, even though Luke's like, no, 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 no. He said, blessed are the poor. Notice never does he ever say, blessed are the rich. What other ways are we impoverished? Perhaps in opportunities to, for employment and different things like that, just to go, go forward in life. There's people that are disadvantaged that way. Yes. I mean, we have st studies done that say that you can tell with near accuracy exactly how someone's life is going to play out based on the exact conditions in which they're born. That's horrible. The, the, the ways that people who are born into uh, impoverished situations or, or, or broken families or in a place that is in a food desert or any number of other things has so much influence about how the rest of the world goes. So there's that kind. And we can keep talking about those kind of pieces, but that's the thing. He wants them to see the need. He doesn't want them to see the way that they are being like, you know what is the worst thing I hear as a pastor? I can't speak for any other pastors, but I can't stand when someone tells me that didn't feed me. And I'm kind of like, I'm sorry. I didn't know I was here to worship you. Like we have to uh, recognize what God is saying. And if we're going to be followers, we have to do that. And, and it's not easy. And in fact, sometimes we'll be oppressed by it. And, and sometimes the rich will be the ones who oppress us. And that's what's going on in James's thing, because there'll be people like, well, we're just fine. We're, we're doing everything the way we're supposed to. God's all right. And, and I have to say sometimes in that prophetic kind of way, and I'm no prophet, I can't imagine what it'd be like to be a prophet, but we have to do better for those who are poor or why on earth does the church of Jesus Christ exist? And if it's to make us happy, then I'm pretty sure when we get to that place where we're like, Lord, Lord, what about us? I don't know you. And that's terrifying because it does mean that it's not just by faith because according to James here, and we're in James' book, I can only talk about James. So this is why other people don't like him. James' book, faith isn't faith unless it's being lived out in the realities of one's existence. 
But there's many ways to do that. There really is. I'm all over the place. Magnificat, we got all over there. Boy, how much scripture have I talked about today? Byron, you taking notes so I can ask these questions later? Since we're talking about the economy in crazy ways like this as well, what was the way the earliest church worked itself out in terms of its economic situation? If we're going to go into Acts, have I gone into Acts yet, Byron? Maybe not. So let's go into Acts. If we talk about Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, or chapter 4, verses 32 through 38, we see this existence of a church where people gave their resources and there was no need among them like a commune yeah it sounds a bit like a commune and i recognize that um based off how i look right now i should be very careful talking about such things because i already know that some people are, are you trying to start a cult no 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 like <laughs> what's beautiful about that is that there was no need among them mm-hmm. how can that live out today in a way that seems true to where we are and is just. <clears throat> and I'm not talking about a nation kind of way. I, and that's, that's beyond my realm of comprehension and things. Um, how, how can we be, just us? We're the only ones we have control over. People are like, well, you got your, your, your vote, great. What, uh, us, us, us? How are ways that we can live where there's, there's an idea of no need among them? And maybe we already are. One of the things that I'm so happy about this church is my dear friend Ted calls it the church of orphaned causes. You've heard that before. Um, We find, it seems to me, those in need and somehow figure out a way to serve them, whether it's showering them, feeding them, whatever, welcoming them with open arms unjudgmentally into our midst. midst. And so that's what I love about this church. And I think we're trying, we really are. I don't have a good answer, except we're trying. Well, there it is. Now, Barb, I, again, and I'm sorry, if, uh, if I, do you feel like I'm picking on you in any of this? I hope not. <laughs> I just appreciate your forthrightness. And, and it's, it's a good conversation because this is an uncomfortable piece otherwise. So many people come to church because they're impoverished in some way. And they need a place where they can belong. And so anyone who feels excluded needs to be able to belong. But they have to belong in this way where there's kind of no need among them. And when James sees that the rich are immediately lifted up by this community and the poor are told to sit at their feet, there is this way that there's still need among them. In a church, there should never be any kind of separation between those who are rich and those who are poor. You shouldn't be able to tell. You should be able to kind of think of them again as brothers and sisters, one big family, maybe some dress differently, maybe some don't. I think it was two years ago on Christmas Eve. Um, my last church, we had three services on Christmas Eve. Um, it was exhausting. I, uh, and, and this particular day, I think it was Christmas Eve on a Sunday. So I had, I had four services and I had been sick the week before. And I hadn't even gotten out of bed until that Sunday morning. And I had to come up with four different sermons. And, and I'm sitting there. And by the eleven o'clock service, uh, before it starts, there's a fellow who comes in, and he grabs a candle and a and a bulletin. It goes off to the far side of the church, but I was still trying to figure out my eleven o'clock sermon, and I saw him, and I was like, "Oh, okay. Well, there he goes." I uh, I, I I I think of him. I hadn't seen him before, and he looked like he was sad, and. Um, and then uh, more people start coming in and, and, but it was, it wasn't, they're sparse and they're sitting down and I lost track of things. And I noticed at some point halfway through the service that the fellow was gone. And I was like, hmm, I, 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 I wish I, I, I should have taken that moment to see him because he looked sad and, and I, I probably need him. Uh, two days later, I got an email 
that came to the wider church from this fellow who said, I was very rough on Christmas Eve and I came to your church hoping to feel better and nobody paid any attention to me. And I left worse. And I didn't want to hurt you. I just wanted you to know. You see, I was worried about a sermon at 11 o'clock when most people were going to sleep right through it anyway. I was <laughs> worried about trying to get everything going. And meanwhile, someone in need walked off to the side and I basically said, through my actions, stay there on the side, sit by my feet. I have more important things to do. I let him, we all let him, feel ostracized from a moment that he needed most certainly to be a part of. Impoverished people to me come in all forms. And especially now, there are so many ways we are impoverished. And if we begin looking at this, trying to figure out just one way, and James was talking about one way, they were impoverished by this poorness, but they were being oppressed by those people. And they were being put into courts by those people. And he says later, they were blaspheming the name of Christ. And here you are lifting them right up. While there's people that they are hurting that you need to lift up. And there are people who are always hurting that we need to lift up. Those are the poor. Those are the impoverished right around us. And we can do that literally and allegorically and metaphorically and in every other kind of way that's true. Because there's literal ways that our church does that too. I got the email today about what I can grab, but anyone who needs food can get food on Friday. And that's not just our church, but there's other churches in the area that do that. And, and again, I love that we get the food too. We don't just give it to the poor because that lets them feel like simultaneously we're all together. I prefer churches when, when they serve the poor and hungry, they sit down with the poor and hungry. Not just like, oh, we're serving you. Here's our soup kitchen. But no, let us eat together. I remember when some people left my first church because on Wednesday nights, we had Wednesday night supper and Bible study. And we started having a lot of homeless people come into our church because we were friendly to them and things, but then they wanted to come to Wednesday night supper and Bible study, but you had to pay for Wednesday night supper or Bible study. And, and you know, they're homeless, they're, they're dirty um, and, and, and they don't smell the best. And, and it's only so big. But we're like, well, let's let anyone in who doesn't have any reason, we'll make sure they can eat anyway. Well, then you have more homeless people coming. And we had, you know, like sometimes half the room were people who were homeless. And yet here they were, and they were in a warm place and eating with others. And then they go into Bible study with everybody else. And it was, it was, it was lovely, except some people didn't like it because they didn't want to be around homeless people. And so they left. And they took their money with them. And it, it is more threatened to leave. I had people tell me I had to let the homeless people go or the church wasn't going to stay open. Huh. Tough call. Are we even a church anymore? <laughs> if I make the wrong call. And you know what? I made the wrong call because I was afraid for my family. You know what the joy of this is for me? This whole book that I didn't like and I'm diving deeper into now to this, these days than ever before is it lets me know some things. And we can just go go into it um, some more. I, I haven't even read the whole thing. Boy, I haven't even gotten to it. I'm, yes, I'm great. That sounded prideful. I didn't mean it that way. I think this is brilliant. <laughs> Has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? Uh, we can talk about rich in faith for a moment. How are poor rich in faith and why are poor rich in faith? 
What if I told you you didn't need anything for God to love you? What if I told you no matter how broken you were, how little you had, no matter how many people have rejected you over and over and over again, you don't need anything for God to love you? People who have everything and find that people only love them if they have everything aren't really good at having faith because they think they need to have everything in an effort to be loved. I know this from personal experience. I'm a firstborn of four who believed that I needed to be perfect to make sure that I could grab all of my parent, my attention my parents were giving to my siblings, each one whom I progressively hated more than the last one because they only took away more of that attention. I got to, I'm kidding, I didn't hate any of them. And actually, I think I progressively hated them less. But like, <laughs> That is the ironic thing to say. But I was perfect. I had to be perfect. I wanted to do all of that. I needed to be so perfect. I would actually leave when I was going home from the third grade and I had my little thing that I needed to have my parents sign to say all of my schoolwork. I would throw out everything that wasn't an A on the way home from the bus stop to make sure that I could present myself as perfect. They'd sign it, Garrett, you're so perfect. I look over at my siblings. Yeah, good luck now, guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem with a sense that you don't have love by faith. Only the poor get to understand faith because only those who aren't trying to be perfect know they can't be perfect. Only those who are like, I can't warrant people loving me because love never works that way in the first place. If you earn love, it's not love. It's like. Like love is something that there's a song that they used to teach the kids in my my son's uh, nursery school that was actually at the church. It was like, love's just like a magic penny. Hold it tight, you won't have any. Lend it, spend it, you'll have so many. They'll roll all over the floor. Like, I like that. That's what love is. Like, I when I figure that out, like, I don't need it. God just loves me. I get to be poor. I, I get to not have all my stuff together. Sometimes I have so little. Like, I remember in seminary, I was really grateful for people who wanted to feed me. Otherwise, I would have gone hungry. I, I've experienced that kind of poverty. I've experienced the poverty of spirit. I've experienced when I go into a place and people are like, oh, you're not quite right. And, and we can't. But in the midst of all of that, when I'm just loved, I know that the only way to have faith is to be poor really poor now i don't mean that if you have your whole life rich of blessings you can't but you understand that you really do if you think about it first you have to kind of be like oh that's not the way the world works and then think about this sense of i don't yeah i i i i'm loved just as i am i i don't need the rich i i, I get to have my poverty of spirit i get to that's the beginning of faith the real kind of faith um and heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him and i could go into that but i have six minutes um so but to get to verse six but you have dishonored the poor again these are his brothers and sisters he's not giving up on anybody What's it mean to dishonor the poor? New English version says insulted the poor. Ah, oh, that's interesting. They did. They they dishonored the poor, insulted the poor by um, putting them down that way. And and yet too, again, who's the only one who really gets honor from us? or supposed to get honor from us. God and Jesus. There we go. God is the one to whom we give the honor. And hence, that's what it means that there's no partiality of people. They just have this impartial kind of way of thinking. Like the moment we show more to the rich or less to the poor, we're giving honor to the rich as though there's some kind of gods. Now then that's different. Now he's, Anyway, anyway, I'm, I'm all about this. And he, so he's talking about that, but let's get to the last three questions because this is the part where it now becomes instructional because it's also practical. Is it not the rich who oppress you? And the answer to that question, of course, was? Yes. Yes. These are the people that you're oppressing. And the moment that you lift up your oppressors over and against those who need to be lifted up, what's wrong with you? Mm -hmm. When we do that in, in very kind of a, 
What's the word I'm looking for? Uh, cultural ways. Uh, but I, I don't I don't want to boggle it down because I think I think it's it. There's ways that we still what I want to say is there's ways that we honor things that are rich now in the world that we don't need to honor because quite frankly they're oppressing us. Um, I'll explain what I mean in one example. Facebook. I use it. I even like it. But what's it doing to the rest of us? Sociologically, culturally. I think it's blinding us to uh, what people are because uh, we're paying too much attention to it and everything is bad news or hate. You have that absolute peace. And it's been used to divide and people are throwing all kinds of things on of it. Yeah. And yet I still kind of use it in that way. And I'll, and we'll talk about it in these kind of ways. But it is, in fact, something that is oppressing people. And maybe it would be best if I stood back from it. Um, I'm sorry, that was a horrible example, especially since I'm currently streaming this live on Facebook. Um, <laughs> is it not they who drag you to court? <laughs> And the ways too that like they're not just ripping these people by oppressing them, but they're dragging into court. They're they're extracting more from them. They're using unjust systems to continue unjust things. And he's like, stop lifting these kind of people up. And finally, it is is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? And I have two minutes to talk about that incredibly dense verse, and I shall. It's beautiful. No, is it not they who blaspheme blaspheming that's an interesting word anyone like to take a quick stab at what blaspheme means <laughs> amen that's fair okay the blasphemy <laughs> has something in the name of christ is the part of their is the part of their uh, oppression to blaspheme i think best means to speak contemptuously, irreligiously, and, uh, and, and basically scandalously about someone, some faith, or some sacred object. Such language is often used, of course, to slander, to discredit, to malign, or even to destroy. Blasphemy is done in all kinds of ways, and uh, what he's saying, first and foremost, is they blaspheme you by speaking ill of Christ. Why is Christ, I don't like the way I'm saying this. Maybe I don't have enough time. Okay, let's try it this way. How often are uh, Christians spoken bad of in, in ways that uh, you don't think is an, a warranted judgment? Have you heard really bad things of, of those of us who aren't so bad. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes. Um, one of the ways still too that I, I don't like is how often people attribute religion to all the atrocities that happened in the world. Like it wasn't uh, combined with every other force, but used like if we just separated this one piece, then the whole world would be at peace. Like, and it's used to discredit or dismiss any kind of good that we would do. Like I, I heard one time one person say, well, you do know in response to, well, they, they've killed more than everybody else Christians. And someone's like, well, you're not 90% of every hospital and school on the face of the planet was opened by Christians. And it becomes kind of this debate, did we do more good or bad? But that's a sense of blasphemy because you can discredit everything in that kind of moment as well. But, uh, but that's not even the piece. They're ripping apart this idea of Christ and they're ripping apart the idea that the poor might be worthwhile because of the very way they're acting and we have to remember that christ was poor and not to mention if they're going to do all of this to the excellent name that was invoked over you i'm going to just say it this way real quick two thousand years ago the first generation or two of the church when you were baptized you were not baptized in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit that came later acts or matthew 28 written 
after the destruction of the temple and, and a couple of generations after Jesus. That's the first Trinitarian and the only Trinitarian framework mm. uh, that we really find in the Bible. But you have a sense of the Trinitarian baptismal formula. Before that, as we see in Acts and all of Paul's letters where things are talked about, when you're baptized, you're baptized in the name of Jesus. So I baptize you in the name of Jesus, which means that you have been claimed by this Jesus, that you have decided simultaneously that you are following this Jesus. And if people who are saying, well, you have nothing, you're still worth it, they're ripping apart the church and all of this. He's saying they're blaspheming the name, they're, they're scandalizing it, uh, they're, they're, they're moving parts to all of these things because the sense of like uh, greatness is not what they're experiencing. The church was never meant to be full of a bunch of credible, like great kind of people. Again, it was always the sense of core that's a part of it. And even to suggest that it's not, it's blaspheming the whole thing a little bit. Um, and James wonders why on earth they're trying to lift up the poor if this is the way the rich have been to them, or they're trying to lift up the rich if this is the way the rich have been to them. And so again, it's an interrogation of sorts. And these are not easy words because it is an interrogation of sorts. He doesn't like the way that they are treating the poor. And so he is on full assault. If James was a lawyer, I would not want to sit on the witness stand while he gets to interrogate me. Because <laughs> he's going to make us uncomfortable in an effort that we live out our faith in accordance with what Christ would call the way. No wonder Martin Luther wanted to get rid of it. Because it can be used harmfully as well. If we tell people there's something they have to do, like sell, buy indulgences to be saved, because we're looking at a book that says work is important, we're failing to recognize what's really going on. God wants us to care for the least of these so much that our faith isn't real, so says James, until we are. And I'm willing to say that all of you are actually there. Maybe you don't think you're perfectly there, but you're there. I know you're there because you still are trying to figure out ways to help people when you see them. You still watch when someone's name comes up on the prayer list, and I hope you take a moment to pray for them. You're still trying to figure out ways to lift others to people up. I watch how people will give food to those who are in need already in this place. And maybe that doesn't mean we can't get better at it. We always can get better at it. Until I look like Jesus, there is better at it. But in the steps that we are taking right now, we must be patient with ourselves. He's impatient with people who've been doing the wrong thing. Don't think that when you're doing the right thing, that you're not doing it right enough. Be patient. Let yourself grow and become. Otherwise, we take these words and we use them to malign others, and thereby we blaspheme that same Christ who was endlessly patient with those who followed him. So if you felt beat up at the end of this bar, I'm picking on you again a little bit. You're not. <laughs> You're still chosen. <laughs> Now, when you see somebody else that you know is too, even if they don't know it, make sure that they know you choose them too. Oh, that's special. I'm going to end there. That sounded good. Um, let's pray. God, for these th three verses, we give you thanks. For the, the, the wrestling that they necessitate, we give you thanks. For your scriptures that force us to think of you in different ways over and over again, we give you thanks. For hard words that speak hope to those who need them, even if they are not me, I give you thanks. For these people who join me on Wednesday nights, I give you thanks. And now may the rest of our evening be something that, for which we can also give you great gratitude. And thanks thereby so share your glory with those that we meet that they might know that they too are special. We choose this in the, or we pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen.